I have my mask on because I'm in the bathroom here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to do this without a mask. I have to do this with my mask on. You'll excuse me. Um, welcome, everybody. This is Mark Neeson calling to you from Chatham University, uh, where we are honored to have Fisby Nissen with us this evening. He's going to give a reading and answer any of your questions that come out. Um, She's here as our Melanie Brown lecturer, which is a, a, a really wonderful gift that we have that's come from Melanie and Fred Brown, uh, who have created an endowment that allows us to bring one writer at least a year, a fiction writer for whom place is a, a specific uh, focus in their writing. And uh, we thank them forever for what they have done and allowed for us. Uh, I've been scouring the country for different writers and, and um, I've been thinking about Thisbe for a, a few years now and, and it, the timing finally worked out well. And um, I'm not gonna tell you any more specifics about Thisbe because I have someone from within our own program, Mr. Matthew Petrus, who's going to officially introduce the to you. Thank you for coming and we'll talk to you again at the end of the show. Matt? Mark must have talked with my mom before and learned that my name is Matthew, but otherwise I go by Matt. <laughs> my mom really appreciates that, I'm sure. Um, this be Nissen's most recent book, Other People Make Love, came at the perfect time in my life. The back cover blurb of the book describes the short story collection as being about, quote, the lives and choices of people questioning the heteronormative institution of marriage. As someone who will be getting married in seven months, I consider myself one of those people. I'm knee deep in wedding planning, which means I have been doing more than my fair share of questioning the heteronormative institution of marriage. I spoke with Thisbe a few weeks ago and she told me that as a fiction writer, she quote, loves stories or pieces of fiction that are set in Petri dish environments, like weddings. Over the years when Thisbe attended weddings, she took notes for potential stories, many of which ended up in this collection. And again, take it from someone in the middle of wedding planning, there's a lot to unpack there. There's way too much to unpack there. Thisbe has written fiction for decades. Another short story collection out of the girls' room into the night, which won the Iowa Short Fiction Award, came out in 1999, followed by three novels, The Good People of New York, released in 2001, followed by Osprey Island in 2004, and Our Lady of the Prairie in 2018. She has also written nonfiction work for publications like Vogue, and she's currently an associate professor at Western Michigan University and has previously taught at the Iowa Writers Workshop, Columbia University, and Brandeis University. This bee's fiction travels across a variety of settings. With just her novels, readers go from the bustling streets of New York in her first novel to a busy hotel on an island in the second to an island prairie for her most recent novel. And with How Other People Make Love, Thisbe situates weddings as a setting, though the stories often take place before or after the big day. Her, her uh, characters often act in opposition to their environment or are defined by not exactly fitting into their environment. This dynamic gives us these other people, as alluded to in the title of How Other People Make Love. Thisbe writes complicated, sometimes strange, and often troubled characters who act in ways the reader wouldn't expect from the outset. One story, Wind's Girl, follows a woman who has a crush on a guitarist and sits right up front to watch his band play every Friday. She has a tragic character flaw. She never stands up for herself. After a car accident leaves her badly injured, she doesn't do anything fun or grandiose with the settlement money. She just decides to rewire her house's electrical system. But as the story progresses, readers see the stick character step out of her comfort zone and start to take agency. Many of her short stories suggest the scope of a novel. You, you find yourself imagining what could have happened before the beginning of the story and after the ending. And no story ends simply or predictably. These are stories to be read and then pondered about for days later. Thisbe also really has a knack for titles. The first two stories in the collection are called quote, alone and clapping, and quote, 
You Are My Favorite Scarecrow. These titles end up pointing readers to very specific parts of each story they may well have glossed over. Bisbee says she loves titles because they offer a wonderful opportunity to direct reader's attention. And once the reader has finished a given story, thinking about its content in conversation with its title adds interesting and complex layers to the work. Bisbee, however, is not obsessed with the label of writer. I asked her what word she'd use and she went with maker. Beyond weaving narratives, she also loves making quilts, both big and small, as well as collages. If you head over to thisbynissen.com, you can check out lots of those quilts. You can also check out dozens of pictures of her chickens. Uh, in the brief but lovely time I've been able to spend with Thisbe, both on the pages of her work and over video chat, I've found her to be warm, open-minded, and, and knowledgeable about a little bit of everything. As a graduate student and budding fiction writer, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet someone who is both incredibly talented, but also leaves their ego at the door. It's my honor to welcome the maker, Thisbe Nissen. Matt, thank you so much. That was so lovely. Um, I'm so appreciative. But I like it, maker. I think I've, I'm going to own that. I'm going to really try and own it. Um, and you can, we were just talking about the chickens earlier. You, lots of pictures of the chickens uh, over, over there. Um, photographing chickens is another one of my, uh, my, my pastimes. Um, so here's a question. Is it still okay if I read Wind's Girl? Did, 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 did Matt do like a good um, segue in? Can I, is it still, somebody give me a, give me a, a something. All right. Okay, yeah, some mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. Thank you for the thumbs up. That's what I needed. That's what I needed. Thank you all so much. This has really been such a pleasure. Thank you, Mark, for bringing me in and everyone who's um, who's just participated in some really wonderful conversations. It's been a really, really lovely time. Um, I am, am very appreciative. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to read this story, Winds Girl. Um, which is a very, uh, a very Iowa story. Um, and maybe I won't say anything more about it in, uh, to start out and we'll just, uh, I can talk about it later some, um, but I'm just gonna go for it. All right, where are we in time? Okay, at some point, you're probably gonna hear like a big noise, which is the garage door opening underneath me when my um, husband and son get home. So if you like hear some big noise, that's what's going on there. So. <laughs> All right. Wind's girl. I'm not ever gonna be Wind Crier's girl. Still, I'm here at the quarry bar to hear him play every Friday night at 10 up front, watching him like I am the guitarist girl, like I am someone Wind Crier loves. I get off work at the slaughterhouse at five, and that's enough time to drive home, have a shower, heat something for dinner, open the mail, watch a little TV, and still make it to the quarry before the crowd claims my table near the stage. By nine, the bar's filling up. Most folks not even changed in their work clothes. Some guys from the cheese factory shooting pool in their coveralls, a young pimply drunk zipped into his jiffy lube jacket, hunched over a tall glass of bourbon. Lonnie Bondorf, Officer Bondorf, walks toward my table like he's ready to arrest me. I take out a cigarette and go for my matches, but Lonnie's there with a lighter so fast he nearly burns my nose off. Here for Wynn's show? Always, I say. Lonnie's quiet a minute. Think he knows you? When? Think he remembers you from every week? I shake my head. I don't know. So how are things with you? Asks Lonnie. Lonnie is a 38-year-old bachelor who'd like not to be. I guess you could say nearly the same thing about me. Past 40. Not a lot of prospects. Going okay, I tell him. My money from the accident just came through. 
Lonnie was one of the first people on the scene that night when they pulled me from my truck. There's the garage door. <laughs> Lonnie was one of the first people on the scene that night when they pulled me from my truck, blood running out my knees like garden spigots. I'd been on my way home from work, stopped at a light, waiting for it to go green when a drunk from Fairfield jumped the divider and plowed me head on. He didn't die either, which I'm glad about. You should get something nice for yourself, Doreen, Lonnie says. I'm thinking I'm going to have the house rewired, I tell him. Aw, that's no fun, Lonnie chides. Funner than frying up in some electrical fire, I say. You know how overdue that house is for an upgrade? So you got someone to do it already, Lonnie asks. Rudy Hatch had a look at it a while back. Since he moved, I've been nervous about finding someone else, getting bids. My sister-in-law had some work done on her fuse box a couple months ago, Lonnie says. Some guy drives in from Seoul and said he did a good job, if I remember right. Do you remember the name, I ask? Dwayne, he says, then pauses, thinking, Dwayne Miller, maybe. Dwayne Miller, I repeat. I'll look him up. On stage, Wynn turns to talk to his bassist, and then a drum beat starts in, and I'm recognizing one of my favorite songs. And for a second, as Wynn turns back around to the audience, I think that maybe he's playing it for me, because even if that smile tucked into his face in the shadow of his hat brim is for everyone out here, it's for me too. Monday on my lunch break, I called Dwayne Miller, who sounds like the nicest guy in the world, but he's over his head in work and doesn't foresee an end to it anytime soon. Shoot, I tell him, I really want to get this done. Hey, he says, I know someone who might be able to fit you in. He's union, so this would be off the record. He's got a side business, totally legit tax-wise and all, but the union bust the hell out of him if they found him out. But it's totally cool, says Dwayne. Only way some of these guys can make a go of it. I'm thinking that Dwayne surely knows more about me than all this. Knows about, knows more than me about all this. Also, maybe it's not a bad idea to have something on the guy I hire, something that'd make him scared to do me wrong. Here, I got the number, says Wayne. His name's Rich, Rich Randall, real good electrician. He'll do you what needs done. Rich Randall's answering machine says, hey, you've reached Rich at A1 Electric. Can't catch you right now. Leave a message and I'll give you a ring. And he sounds young and laid back. So I don't feel stupid leaving my name and number, my little story. He calls back that very afternoon. And the fact that I'm at a desk at work to answer the phone makes me grateful all over again in a weird way for my accident. I used to be on the floor standing all day sawing carcasses, but my legs can't take it now. Lots of people thought I shouldn't have been doing it in the first place. It's more men's work on the floor, but I'm no small girl and I had the strength for it. Hey, Doreen, says Rich. Thanks for your message. Love to come have a look at your wiring. When's good for you? Rich agrees to come over after I get off work. Look forward to meeting you, he says. Hang up relieved that this is going to be easier than I thought. Taking care of my parents' house the way a grown person should. It's been mine since my dad passed. He was a house painter by trade, a handyman of all sorts at home, though since he's been gone, I found out my dad didn't know quite all he thought he knew about house repair. Last year, I started blowing fuses right and left. That's when I had Rudy Hatch in to see what the hell was going on. Rudy was hooting at some of the rig ups dad had going crazy, wiring strung together like daisy chains, all the parts salvaged from junk and practically held together with duct tape. The bid he made to bring me up to code came in at just under $4,000, which I didn't have at the time. Plus, it seemed sad to take apart all dad's work. Rich Randall arrives at my house a few minutes behind me, just enough time for me to clean out the cat box. He's younger than I am, maybe 30. And the first thing I think is that he looks like my ex-boyfriend, Walter, but in a good way. 
bad parts of Walter take over the good ones in my memory. Walter had told me he was a roofer. We'd been going out five months before I found out he was making methamphetamines in his bathtub. And I'm not the kind of person who dates a drug dealer and a liar on top of it. But somehow in the end, it was like I got dumped for not being cool enough to be the girlfriend of a big time Iowa meth dealer. Same with the car accident. It was Lonnie Bondorf who made me press charges, found me a lawyer, made me go through with it. I'd never have done it on my own. I'd have found some way to think that sitting at a stoplight and getting head on by a drunk guy in a blazer was something I was 100% to blame for. Rich removes his cap, holds out a hand. Real good to meet you. He looks like a little bit of a brute, but sweet too, balding too early, but owning up to the truth of the thing and shaving his whole head. His sweatshirt says, local number 329, union yes, which comforts me. We go through the house together. Him apologizing for every bureau and plant stand he has to push out of the way. Me apologizing for it being in the way in the first place. Rich speaks with authority, explains his terms, talks me through what he's doing, and lets me stop him when I don't understand something. Pigtail, I repeat, and then tucks his face under the bill of his cap while he backtracks, embarrassed by his own failure as my guide through the world of electricity. It's just the word we use, he says, for how you attach the new wire to the old wire. He's making sure I'm with him every step. Got it, I say. You're great, he tells me. Most people just want to keep not knowing what the hell's going on in their walls. They're just like, you do it and tell me when you're done. And then you get done and show them the bill and suddenly they're all real interested in it all. My dad was a house painter, I say. He used to get so mad about the people who would hire you to do a job and then sit watching over your shoulder every move you make, every move you made. Or they'd change their mind five times about what color they wanted for the vestibule and then acted like it was your fault when the paint looked different on the wall than it did on the true value hardware card. I tell him, I guess I also just hate the feeling of, I, I guess I also just hate feeling ignorant. And that's great. He's looking right at me. I believe everyone should know as much as they can about stuff. Pausing at the top of the stairs, he leans on the banister. Like, take for instance, I play guitar. You do? I blurt. Yeah, got a band. <laughs> kind of on the edge. A lot of computer technology. Samples? So, like I was saying, I need someone to work on my guitar. I want to know what he's doing. I want to know he's not saying like, oh, you need new pickups and the action adjusted, which would be like five hours of labor. And really all he's done is solder one minuscule fucking wire and I'm paying through the nose. It's the same thing. I mean, here's this thing that you don't know jack about and here I am and this is what I know, you know? I mean, I know electricity and I can tell you anything. And you'd have to be like, okay, sure, whatever you say. I did have a couple other people look at it, I tell him. And that's why you're the best kind of customer, he tells me, because you're informed, because you're not just letting someone tell you what to do. I hope so. I wanna trust Rich, but you do hear horror stories. Here's what should happen, Rich tells me. You need to think about this. Make sure I'm the right person for the job. I can get you some references if you want. I shake my head, embarrassed that he thinks I'll check up on him. Well, I can give them to you. I'm a good electrician. I'm an excellent electrician, really. You don't have to have any doubt about that. Downstairs, Rich sits at my kitchen table doing some calculations while I make him a cup of coffee. Then I sit down and we go over them. He points to some numbers. Here's materials, he says, and projected labor. He points again, and here's your total might be a little higher than the bids you got before. And I know I do charge a little more for labor than some, but I stand behind the fact that my work's worth it. I lose some business, probably people not willing to pay for a job done right, people willing to cut corners. And I'm just not, not with electricity. We're talking about safety here. His bid is not too far over Rudy's given that he's talking about dealing with the grounding in the basement and the outdoor sockets that Rudy never even thought about. 
not to take anything away from your old electrician, Rich says, but some people just don't think of everything, you know? I wait a day before I call Rich back to tell him, yes, let's start whenever he's ready. I actually just had a cancellation on another job, he says. Haven't wanted to take too much on, what with the move and all. Oh, you're moving? Yeah, yeah, wave it out in Texas part-time for a while back and forth, seeing how hard it's gonna be to find work and stuff. My wife's there now, in fact, trying to find us a place. So uh, I'm on kid duty till she gets back, but I can start Monday if that's good with you, Doreen. You have kids? Seven and three, he tells me. And for a second, I think he's telling me he's got 10 children from two different women. That's great, I say. Yeah, we'll see how great it is by the end of the week. They miss mommy right now. Tell you the truth, I don't blame them. I miss mommy too. I laugh a little. So I'll see you Monday, Doreen. Great, I say. And it all seems way too easy. Um, I work, but the door's unlocked. You can just come in. That's okay with you? He asks. You're okay having me here while you're not home? Some people are funny about that. That's why I asked. Oh, it's fine, I say, the doubt washing over me, sudden as sickness. Rich hedges a moment. I hate to bring money into this, but I guess that's what makes the world go round. The way I usually do it is I have you give me half up front for purchasing supplies and materials and half on completion. That sounds fair, I agree. I try to think of what I'm supposed to ask. Should... Could I leave a check for you on Monday? The check's just fine. Oh, oh, also, he says, I just wanted to make sure. Dwayne told you about the union stuff, right? We all do it. Only way to hack it with the way everything works nowadays. I just wanted to make sure Dwayne let you know about that, that you were okay with that and all. Yeah, I stammer. Yeah, he said about you doing stuff on the side. That man is a fucking prince, Rich says. When you said it was Dwayne sent you, I knew this was a job I'd take. He puts me in touch with the nicest people. After the car accident, the doctor at the hospital assigned me to a lady at the community mental health center to go talk to if I wanted, if anything about the accident or anything was bothering me, keeping me awake at night, making it hard to go about my life work, whatever. Honestly, I think it was my job the doctor was worried about. When he found out I worked on the slaughterhouse line, he went a little white. Men worry like that. Can't believe what I do, what I did for my job, but he meant well. So I took the number and then when I was feeling sort of blue afterward, working in the office, feeling washed up and old, Sherry, who works next to me said, why don't you go see that counselor, Doreen, see if she's got anything to say. The therapist's name was Brianna, which she pronounced like she was royalty, Brianna. When I first went to see her, she pried a while into the accident, but more into my job, like she was sure I had a whole world of rage under my skin. She was dying to tap. She scheduled me for another appointment. I was too embarrassed to argue. Maybe there really was something smoldering in me that I didn't even know about. I go and see her every other week now. Mostly she tells me, about the sagas of her love life, which are always turbulent and interesting in a soap opera kind of way. The day after I meet Rich, I'm scheduled with Brianna. And when she politely asks me how I am before she launches into her latest drama, I find myself talking about the electric job and about Rich Randall. Is this a man you're attracted to? Doreen, she asks right away. No. <laughs> I say too quick, no, I mean, no, I mean, he's married. <laughs> Disappointed, Brianna switches tactics. Is it, are you nervous about having this man in your house while you're not there? That can feel very invasive, Doreen. Your home is a private place. It's your nest, you know, where you're most fully yourself. Maybe think about taking Monday off work. They get along without you at the slaughterhouse for one day. You let yourself get work too hard. Brianna is always suggesting this, and I've run out of ways to try to tell her that I'm fine. It seems like unless you're lower than low or happier than God, no one believes anything you tell them when they ask how you are. 
But when my alarm goes off Monday morning, I don't want to go to work. By 7.30, I've convinced myself that it'd be irresponsible to just leave my parents' home in the hands of some stranger. For the first time in 10 years at the slaughterhouse, not counting after the accident when I couldn't even walk, I call in sick. It's almost noon before Rich arrives. Doreen, didn't expect to see you here. I got the day off, I say, but suddenly I'm scared he thinks that I'm Suddenly, I'm scared he thinks that I'm mad he's getting started so late, and the thought of him, a grown man waiting to be scolded, makes me suddenly miss my father. Dad took care of things, and even if he didn't know exactly what he was doing all the time, he felt like he did, and I felt sure in his sureness. His absence hits me in the chest, and it's like I can't breathe. Great, Rich says. Great to see you. Guess I'll just get to work then, if that's good with you. Rich hoists his tool belt on his hips and starts toward the nearest socket, aiming something that looks like a screwdriver with a crank to wind it like a music box. He unscrews the outlet cover, me just feeling dumb, just standing there watching. How are your kids? I think to ask. Rich laughs. Surviving? He pauses, leans against the wall like he needs a rest, shaking his head in near disbelief. They're such a trip, you know? I shake my head. I don't have any. I gesture around the house. No children hidden anywhere. <laughs> it's a crazy thing. Crazy? God, you ever just listen to the things that kids will say? I mean, just the shit that comes out of their mouth. Such a trip. Kaylee, my daughter, she's three. She gets these really bad allergies and we have to pump her full of Benadryl before she goes to bed at night. Before she goes to sleep, she'll be totally wandering around the house all doped up saying the craziest, trippiest things. Last night, some guys from the band were over and I swear, I just followed Kaylee around with a mic, just picking up the crazy shit she's saying. It's going to be awesome when I get it looped into a track. I'm laughing, almost not believing what he's saying, but laughing anyhow. God, you should totally have kids, Doreen. They're so damn awesome. And he makes it sound like a good idea. Like I should remember to pick up a couple of kids next time I'm at the store. Rich turns back to the socket and pulls a wire from the wall, inspects it. Okay, he says, I see what we need here. Hey, so Doreen, if you got that check on you now, I'll go ahead, go get the supplies I need. Oh, sure, I say, way too chirpy. I get my purse and my checkbook and make out a check to Rich Randall for $2,500. Don't spend it all in one place, I say. And Rich laughs like I'm actually funny and I feel grateful for it. For the second time in 10 minutes, I feel the loss of my folks again so hard it could have been yesterday. Rich is gone a couple hours and comes back carrying an old worn cardboard box full of stuff, tools and screws and nails and stuff, which he plunks down in the dining room and starts digging through. Menards was all out of the wire I needed, but I hunted some down through my distributor. He holds up a spool, so we're good to go. It's nearing three in the afternoon. Rich works steadily through until 4.30 when he comes and finds me in the living room reading a magazine and tells me he's got to go pick up his kids from his wife's mother's place. Looking good, he says, we'll have you all safe enough to code in no time. It'll really be a relief, I say. I never had the money to do it until now. I was in a car accident and the settlement just came through, so I finally had some money. I mean, I don't usually have money. It was this crazy thing. It's weird, isn't it? Rich says, how you get a bunch of money all of a sudden and you think that it'll make everything easier. It's just all, it's super confusing. I mean, for instance, me and my wife, we came into a bunch of money kind of recently, like a good chunk of money, you know? And we thought, oh, it'll be so much easier now. But then there's all that shit about what do we spend it on and her being like, you are not using our money to buy that vintage jar and me being like, I sure as fuck am. Rich smiles. And here you are doing the responsible thing like my wife would do, not like me. I'm bad. I mean, sometimes I've been sober five months now, but before that, you know, I used to get into some shit in my youth, you know? 
And I know maybe it's not the most responsible thing, but you got to live, you know? I mean, you ever do coke? I shake my head. No. Rich's eyes are almost closed, like he's reliving a great pleasure. He breathes in deep. Oh, boy, he says, letting his breath huff out of him in resignation. Man, we used to do some incredible shit down in Mexico. You know how they make Coke? He asks. Again, I shake my head. They do this whole process thing, he explains. But the guys we knew down there, the guys who were making it, they'd have the purest kind, like the first, most pure stuff and be cut with peaches or coconuts. I mean, peach cocaine, you never had anything so incredible. But I got kids now, family to think about. No more of that shit for me. No more heaven. His head's beginning to wag back and forth as though he's watching it all slip away. The next day I go to work, but I drive home on my lunch hour just to see how things are going. Rich isn't there and it doesn't look like he has been. I make myself a sandwich. When the front door opens suddenly and it's him, I start like I have something to hide. Doreen, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I just came home for some lunch. I held up my dirty plate as evidence. I just didn't expect you all. I'm just, just a little late getting started. It's been a hell of a morning. Jesus. He runs a hand over his head. Jesus, it's been such a fucking morning. And I got work to do. I've got a job to do here. He looks around my house like it's the most important thing in the world to him, this old place. I have been on the phone with lawyers all morning, he blurts out. They got my wife in jail in Texas. Can you believe that bullshit? They want 2,000 bucks bail to get her out. So I'm down at the bank trying to get money fucking wired to Texas or some shit, trying to get a lawyer out there for her. It's going to be a fucking fortune. Wait, I say, wait, what? Your wife's in jail? Oh, it's total bullshit, Rich says. Something about the place she's working out there or the place she worked last year or something like the company's being investigated for tax fraud or something. And everyone is working there during that time in question. They came and arrested them all. They say my wife knows something, which is bullshit. She doesn't know anything. And now I have to come up with 2000 bucks to get her out of jail, which is such bullshit. Wait, I say, trying to slow him down, trying to back this up to where I can understand. Wait, here. Sit down. I pull him out of chair at the table. He looks about to bury his face in his hands and cry. I pull out the chair across from him. Okay, I say, go slow. <laughs> Tell me what happened. I feel sort of like Brianna, if Brianna ever did her job right. <laughs> Do they even understand the fact that she's got fucking kids? That there's two little kids at home saying, where's mommy? Jesus. He hangs his head and I'm afraid he really will cry. Okay, I say, your wife worked for some company that's in trouble with the IRS and they arrested all the employees? They can't be legal. They can't just, yeah, well, they did, he says. And now I got to figure out how I'm going to get to Texas to go get her out of jail. And I got this job to do for you and Rich, you can finish here when you get back. It's okay. He looks at me then away like he can't bear the kindness. God, I'm glad it's you I'm working for right now. A union job? And they'd say, that's shit for luck, man. Your wife's going to have to find some other way out of prison because you ain't going nowhere. Then there's resolve in his voice. No, he says, you know, my wife's mom's got the kids and there's nothing I can do till the damn lawyer calls me back. He pats the cell phone in his pocket. So I'm going to stay here, get as much done as I can so I can finish tomorrow maybe and have it off my mind. Tell you what, Doreen, I'll get to work. Get a jump on this. Hey, and I'd really appreciate it if you didn't say anything about this, just for the kids' sake. I, I just don't want everybody going around knowing Haley Randall's in jail, you know? There's a lot of people who will judge you without knowing anything about what it was about, you know? 
It's no problem, I tell him. By my watch, it's 10 past one, and I'm about to be late back to work after lunch for the first time in my life. Rich isn't there when I get home at 5, 10 p.m., but at 8.30 p.m., there's a knock on the door. Really sorry to bother you, Doreen, Rich begins. I'm just trying to get all my business taken care of before I leave for Texas. I got a flight out day after tomorrow. Kids are with my old partner, Butch, tonight. He's looking after him so I can buy some time, get things finished up. I got everything inside the house here done today. I just got that stuff we talked about in the basement left. If I can get that taken care of tonight, I'll finish up tomorrow. And now I'm feeling scared wary like this is too much too irregular but he's in such dire straits that I don't know how to figure out what's true how's your wife doing I ask a mess he says she's a total wreck she's freaking out it looks worse than she thought I guess it's looking like she did know what was going on in the office and all like she was aware and didn't do anything or just went along or something I don't know what. She's just totally freaking out now. He stands there shaking his head a minute and then says, hell, might as well get some work done here. Keep my mind off it all. He starts fast toward the cellar door. Late that night when I know Rich is gone, I go down to the basement. There's some sawdust on the floor beneath an outlet, which looks new, but I have no way of knowing what he's done, if he's done anything. In the morning, I wake up panicked and take the day off work again. Rich arrives just past nine, looking like he hasn't slept. I have thought up a long story of why I am not at work today, but Rich doesn't even seem to notice I'm home when I shouldn't be. How are you holding up? I ask. Tell you the truth, it sucks, Rich says. Tell you the God's honest truth, it's so much more messed up than I can even describe. He sinks down at the kitchen table. At a loss, I pour him a cup of coffee. What happened? Well, he sips from his mug. Truth is, my wife didn't know about what was going on with her boss and the money and stuff. The thing is, I knew about it too. It was like totally low-key thing, sort of like a Robin Hood thing. The only people, and I mean the only ones getting screwed were the fucking feds and their assholes. It was just this thing that have been going on forever at this company, just like a thing you went along with when you got hired, you know? So after all these years, they finally get caught. Now it's my wife facing jail time. So fucking backwards. I don't even know what to say. I just want this all to be over. There's that much I got left to finish here, Rich says. I'll be done today with pretty much everything. What is left, I ask. Suddenly, I wish I had an inventory, a plan, all written down in front of me, but it's way too late for that. Well, let's see. There's that fuse box, he remembers, and the outside switches, I remind him. Oh, yeah, right. Forgot about those, the outside switches. And you did all the pigtailing already, I say. Rich smiles, slow and deep, like he's remembering a joy he thought was lost all pigtailed he tells me okay so i'll go out and get those switches now can i ask you doreen and he looks pained for a second can i ask if you could lay out that money i left my checkbook at home and they put a fucking fucking freeze on my credit cards while the shit gets sorted can you lay out for this material and we'll subtract off what you still owe me i feel frozen how much do you need 50 do it or you could just make out the check to Menards and I'll fill in the amount, whatever's good for you. I panic everything in me saying, don't give this man any more money. But how do I not when he's acting like this is just how these things work and maybe they do, what do I know? I try to tell myself about the union that I can report him if I have to. I can't think, is it safer to give him a check or cash? I head for the stairs. I think I have some money in the bedroom. God, what a moron I am. Rich has gone two and a half hours. I spend them practicing what to say when he comes back. Rich, you can't just tell the person you're working for that you're part of criminal activity. You can't expect someone to trust you with their money 
when you tell them you've stolen money, even if it is from the IRS. When he breezes back in the door, it's like he's been gone 10 minutes. The pile of switches he drops on the kitchen table don't look like they came from any store at all. Doreen, do you think I should use your telephone for just a minute? He looks like he's going to cry again, and I don't know what I can say, but sure. He dials, leans against the wall, and waits. Pumpkin, he says. Pumpkin, it's daddy. And I think at least he wasn't lying about the kids. Hey, sweetheart, go get Uncle Butch and put him on the phone to talk to daddy now, okay? Good girl. If she calls, Rich is saying in the phone, you tell her to keep her mouth shut. I'll be there tomorrow. Figure it out. Tell her to stay quiet, okay? He pauses a moment, listening. Thanks, man. You're my hero. He hangs up the phone, then turns to me. Oh, Doreen, what a fucking mess. He sinks down at the table and lays his head on the switches and wires. Did something else happen? I'm a little kid, squeaky and dumb. He lifts his head, wagging it back and forth remorsefully. What a fucking disaster, this whole thing, he says. It was supposed to be so easy. We were just going to do it and be done, and that's it. It was so fucking easy. He looks right at me, then back down like he's ashamed. I haven't told you the whole story, he says. There's a lot more going on than was such an easy plan and it worked so damn well this guy the one Haley worked for works for I don't know he got this RV you know one of those huge honking ones and he got the whole inside hollowed out and all Haley has to do for two-thirds the profit two-thirds all she has to do is sit in the goddamn passenger seat and pretend the guy's her lover and she's going over to Mexico with him for the day. Just going over with her little boyfriend for the day to have their little affair. I don't want to know this. I don't want to be hearing this. And I know I don't want to just stop until I've heard it all. So they get pulled over on the way back into the States, he says. Done it five, six times, no problem. This time they get pulled over. And you gotta understand the take was so good. How can you say no to money like that? We thought we'll do it a few times, be able to get the kids some nice Christmas presents, just live comfortable, you know? We're trying to strike it rich or anything, just trying to make things nice for our kids. I'm nodding, I think, at least I mean to be nodding. So they get pulled over and Haley's, Haley's fucking intelligent. When they find the stash, the whole back of the RV is filled with pot now, marijuana, you know? So when they find it, Haley starts doing a whole act like, what the fuck's going on, you bastard? You invite me to come over the border with you for a lot of fun? Really, you're running drugs, you fucking bastard. She's making like, she's got no idea beyond that she's having a little fling with the married guy, no idea, but anything in the back of the RV, she's fucking brilliant. Only they bring her in anyway, with him, seize the whole fucking RV. We're talking 500 grand in the back of that bus, sitting in some federal pen. 500 grand of really fine marijuana drying out in some government warehouse. It fucking kills me. But she knew, I managed to ask, she knew the pot was there, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we all knew. There was just Haley and me and the guy driving the RV, really. Marshall, he's Butch's brother. Rich gestures toward the telephone. I nod. I'm thinking one third Marshall's and the rest two thirds for Rich and Haley. I'm thinking, I don't know how to live in this world. When Rich leaves that night, there's a pile of old electrical switches on my kitchen table. When I get home from work the next day, the pile is still there. When I call Rich's number, the machine picks up, same voice as before. Hey, you've reached Rich at A1 Electric. Of course, he's in Texas by now, if I can believe that much. I call and leave so many messages on his answering machine. I'll be scared if he ever does call back. I try being nice at first, but then I lose nice. I threaten to report him to the union threatened to sue him for the money he's taken from me for the work he hasn't done. I threatened to report him to child welfare. It's easy to threaten an answering machine. The threat I do not make 
the threat I do not make regards what I know of his drug smuggling operation. The thought of saying drug smuggling operation makes me feel like I'm playing Nancy Drew. Maybe the drug story was a lie to like everything before it. Maybe Rich Randall hasn't gotten all the way to the end of his tale. About a month after Rich's disappearance, I'm at the quarry one Friday night, sitting at my table just before Wynn's second set, ready to light myself a cigarette when the bar door opens and suddenly standing there, shaking the snow from his wool cap and stamping his feet on the indoor outdoor rug is Rich Randall. And I'm so knocked over, I can't even move. My stomach hollows inside me, my lighter shaking so hard in my hands, I can't even raise it to my mouth. I just sit there dumb and shaking and staring. I've had two beers already and part of a third. And maybe that's what kicks in once the nausea passes because what I'm left with is a fury, like no fury I have ever known. I stand up. He recognizes me from a few feet away, but that first recognition is friendly. Eyes lit up the way they do when you come back to a place you've been gone from and start spotting people you used to know. First, you don't realize who they are, just that you know them. A split second later, they come into focus, a name, a context, a placement, history. I watch all of this happen in Rich Randall's face as I walk toward him, his expression shifting, recognition, realization, fear. And then from fear, from that tiny little millisecond of fear I see in him, which I know he knows I see. From fear, he crosses seamlessly into disdain, a clear, smirking, righteous grin. And then he tries to pretend he's never seen me before in his life. Did you just plan on never coming back, on never finishing what you started? Rich Randall just looks at me, his eyes gone deliberately blank. He blinks. Excuse me? He looks around like maybe I'm talking to someone else. You fucking bastard, I say to him. You fucking, whoa, lady. He backs up a step. Take it somewhere else, sister. The words are choking in me. I'm so angry. I feel like I'm spitting. Only I realize what I'm actually doing is crying. I'm standing in the middle of the quarry bar while Wind Crier takes the stage, tears running down my face. As I say to this man, this stupid, cowardly, criminal man, get out of here. Get out of here right now. You don't deserve to hear a note that man plays. You're a thief. Get out of here. Get out of here now. On stage, wind starts strumming and I can see Rich's body respond to the music, soften and find the beat like he's relaxed as anything. He looks right at me, then tosses his head and laughs. And then he turns back to the stage, grooving along to the music. I spin away and run to the ladies' room where I splash my face, pull myself together. And without looking at Rich, I walk back to my table where Lonnie Bondorf is sitting now, Miller genuine draft in hand, staring up at Wynn like he's in love with him too. I fish cigarette out of my purse and hold it up for Lonnie to light. My hand is shaking and Lonnie sees something's wrong. Doreen, he asks, are you okay? I make a quick glance back at Rich, standing smug in his spot by the door, hands shoved in his pockets, his head nodding in time to the music. I say to Lonnie, I don't know, see that guy over there? Lonnie nods. I say, I was waiting for the laser and he started sort of hitting on me and then he just started saying weird stuff. Lonnie looks like he can't decide what kind of suspicious to be. Suspicious like an older brother or like a policeman. What kind of weird stuff, he asks. Like sort of crazy stuff like, do I wanna see the gun in his pocket and do I know it's looted and that he's got all sorts of other stuff out in his car? And do I want some drugs? He's got pot if I want or Coke. He was trying to get me to come out to his car to smell his peach flavored cocaine. I just said, no, thank you. Then he called me a bitch. Lonnie stands without a word and sets his beard down on the table. He pushes in his chair and starts walking toward Rich with the kind of purpose in his step that makes people afraid of the police. On stage, Wynn and the band play the final chord of a song and it's like the whole place is holding its breath together. Wynn's mouth is moving, which makes me realize I'm staring right at him, but I can't even hear what he's saying. 
like it's just his mouth moving, but the volume's gone muter. I've gone deaf or I'm frozen, staring, waiting for the world to start again. Only it's like everyone else is staring too and who they're staring at is me. The first thing I hear again, breaking through my ears, like they're popping is someone yelling from the back of the bar, some man yelling, yo, lady, what the fuck song you wanna hear? Let's get a move on the man ain't got all night. And I'm confused and disoriented. And then suddenly I'm afraid he's talking to me and I don't know what I've missed and I don't know what to do. And everyone seems to be waiting for something until finally it's Wynn who's talking again. And I can hear his voice this time sounding like he doesn't understand what's going on either, looking at me like I'm crazy as they come. And then to the audience, like he's saying, go figure. Only what he's saying is, well, I guess we'll just go and choose one ourselves." And then he shrugs and turns to confer with the band. From the back of the bar, I hear someone say, what the? And I turn and see people clearing the way for Lonnie, who's coming up on Rich Randall. And I can see the path that's cleared for Lonnie in the crowd. I can see Lonnie say to Rich, would you please step outside with me a minute, sir? And Rich is just looking at him like, no way, fuck off, dork. So that's when Lonnie gets to flash his badge and say, sir, I'm going to ask you to step outside and I am not going to ask you again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that story is so fun to read <laughs> all right but i feel like i'm like off in some zone i'm like not here with you <laughs> other people say things so i don't feel awkward <laughs> That was so great. I was so stressed Thank out you. the whole time. See, do you have to, do you rehearse, especially the parts where you get going really fast? I, I don't, I've read it like, I've read that to an audience once before and I, maybe I did practice before that. Um, but I don't, I don't, I think I would just, I would get all like way too self-conscious if I did. It's almost like I just have to sort of do it and, you know, just like put the blinders on or something and be like, okay, here we go. I'm, I'm just in it for a little while. Um, do you, questions? <laughs> Arista, did I say your name right? Yes, excellently. But you're, but you're the best. You're, you're so expressive. I just looked up at you, and you always had such great expressions. I was like, it's okay. I'm doing okay. <laughs> thank you. I, I had so much fun, and I wanted to say I'm so glad you decided to read Wind Girl because um, I read it earlier in your book, but it is such. It is double the joy to hear again because you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop and then it keeps <laughs> dropping. <laughs> There's so many shoes. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. And I had a question. Um, so something that I picked up this time that I hadn't because I didn't know what was coming was uh, this bit about Doreen's um, ex-boyfriend and how he was involved in drugs of some kind. And so she broke up with him. And that got me thinking, really, I'd love to know how you put uh, the pieces of this story together, like what came first and then what you sort of peppered in later. Yeah, God, you know, I I honestly wish I, I knew or could really remember, but I think like I can tell, here's the pieces I can tell you of it. So, this may be the only story that I've ever really written out of a sense of revenge. And I, I don't like, you know, there, I too owned a home in Iowa that needed to have some electrical work done on it. And I too was a, you know, new to home ownership and to trying to be a responsible adult and, you know, trying to be cool and not treat the people who were doing work for me like shit and, you know, like sort of, um, and 
and at this point i mean this we're 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 talking 20 years ago now um at this point i really can no longer remember what story the guy actually told me and like which parts i've completely made up like it's just all mushed together it was pretty crazy though and there was just nothing I could do. And I had that feeling to <laughs> my mom, who I can never stop talking about. Um, my mom used to, when whenever like anything would go wrong in my life, and my mom would go, Fizz, you'll write this. You'll write this. <laughs> and I was like, like, that's like the last thing you want to hear, you know, like your your heart's broken and your mother's saying, like you're going to write about this. It's going to be great. But like, there was part of like, <laughs> like that, like trying to channel my mom and be like, this, you're going to write this. Like, There's nothing else you can do except like, I just had no recourse. You know, that was it. It was just, it was over. I was, you know, I, there's nothing else I could do. And so I, in, and I don't, as, as you know, from yesterday, like I really do most often write from like that sense of like place and trying to work myself into like revenge is not usually the place I write from, but then there were other, there were other pieces of it that, um, that like came together, you know, so they're, they're, there was like the horrible therapist that I got assigned to at the community mental health unit who just would sit there and tell me the stories of her love life. And I was like, is this for real? This is crazy. And then, and then I heard about some woman I knew who worked at a slaughterhouse, you know, and that piece sort of comes in and, you know, I, 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 um, I, had a boyfriend who was a musician and we spent lots of time going to live shows and there was a whole sort of world around that and, and I, there was a woman who was there every time Bo Ramsey played like she was right up front and she was just so meek and dowdy and earnest and lovely and I just like I just wanted to know like like she was there every time you know like and I just I wanted to know what she thought or how she thought about him or what you know what it it meant or I mean she always had that table right by the stage you know and just so I think like it's all those like those pieces starting to come together and realizing like okay you know maybe there's a a story in here or, or maybe I get revenge on the crooked electrician somehow. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? You see you I mean I haven't read like your full oeuvre but <laughs> So the lights keep going off. You haven't. Um, so, um, well, what? Have you been really on, Speaking of and Mercury's in retrograde, FYI. <laughs> so, um, but you seem to be like there's some kind of impulse around like failing mechanics, or <laughs> I'm thinking about like how the the um, the good people of New York starts with the broken doorbell, and it like that's like kind of what kicks off. Oh, that's so I don't know. I just, is that like I a love that. I love that. No, I don't, but, but I think, but that totally makes sense. You say it and it totally makes sense to me because there's that, like, you know, there is that sense or, or every creative writing class you're always hearing about, you know, like wanting characters to have agency and, you know, all this, but then there's like those places in life where you can't have agency like there's no like you there's you don't have anything to have agency with like you have no tools you have no anything you know it's like it's like you bring your car to the mechanic and they can tell you anything they want to tell you because what you know you just need to be able to drive somewhere <laughs> and they're like I think that feeling of like like we can't, I mean, I'm a total control freak and there are things that you can't have any control over. And so what do you do? Like, how do you navigate that space? And I think like maybe it's in that space that interesting 
things might happen. Like, I mean, there's conflict. Like if you want to get creative writing, you talk about it, you know, like something's broken. That's conflict. How do you, you know, how do the characters deal with the fact that this thing that they count on isn't working the way it's supposed to work, you know? And that's like, I think that's probably the easiest way to sort of like story, it's right there. You know, you you need something to do what, what it's expected to do and it doesn't, then what? <laughs> so this means recipe for stories, make something break and then figure out <laughs> what to do about it. It's a great prompt. <laughs> I, the, I always used to, I, I grew up in, in New York City and I really always used to sort of dream about the concept of getting stuck in an elevator with someone and like actually really getting to know them like for real because like we couldn't just be New Yorkers like passing by and so like you know because we we're stuck in that elevator together and like something real might actually happen and there I'm back to Matt and the and the petri dish you know like that that idea of like the elevator breaks you're stuck in there like something's gonna happen I don't really want to get stuck in an elevator. Nicole looked frightened. I'd <laughs> never be as good as you think it would be. Hey, excuse me, can I ask you a question? You were talking about um, uh, not what you can't expect. Um, I always feel like when I'm looking at, at your tales, I, I, I can't expect anything. I mean, I, I, they never go in any way I would ever predict as I'm reading the thing. And, and the way you end stories is just, uh, always so stunning to me. Um, can you talk at, at all about, about endings and, and or, or how they work differently maybe for you within a short story that you could work rather than the long form? Yeah, I mean, I can try. I think, you know, the first thing that I thought of when you were saying that was um, was this this metaphor that <laughs> came to me many years ago when I was teaching. Um, I taught for for a bunch of years. I, I, I am going to get back to your question. I promise it's it's in here somewhere. So um, I I taught for a number of years at the Iowa Young Writers Studio. It was like two weeks of writer summer camp for teenagers, and I would always be saying to my students like like we'd read something and I'd be like, okay, but is it a story? You know, what makes it a story? Like, okay, but is it a story? And finally, you know, they were super smart kids. And at one point someone was like, um, Bisbee, what do you think a story is? So I launched it. So I'm like, okay, that's fair. Like, I guess I better sort of, you know, put my money where my mouth is and sort of, what do I think a story is? And so I start talking to them and I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, gesticulating wildly, like I can't help but do whatever I talk. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying like, well, I think to be a story, it's got to have like autonomy and it's got to sort of be whole unto itself and, and, um, and like fully integrated and stuff. But I realized while I was sitting there talking to them that I kept, the gesture that I kept making was like this, like, it was like I was holding a big marble or something and not it's not working in zoom right now but um but like 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 somehow there was like this was like it's got weight unto itself you know but then i got really worried suddenly that i was somehow telling them that like a story like that i was picturing some like spherical something and that i was telling them a story had to be like round and shiny and smooth and whatever and i was like okay wait forget that like it, like it, it's okay it's not a marble it's not like a just don't think about that it's like a i was like okay like think about it like a giraffe and i mean this is all just sort of coming off the top of my head while i'm doing i'm like okay so like think about a giraffe like well, what a giraffe is like this crazy looking creature it's got the crazy long neck and the wacko spots and the little nubby things and big gray tongue. I mean, like giraffes with long legs. And, and I was like, but a giraffe is perfect. Like it, everything about a giraffe is exactly what it needs to be to engage in its girafehood. You know, like the, 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 this giraffe is like, is it perfect? And I was like, so what I'm holding here in my hand, it is not some like 
shiny polished spear of the story i'm like i'm holding a bonsai giraffe here like this is like you want a story to be like a bonsai giraffe and so of course like when we go the rest of the week in this in this thing and all the like all the students you know all my evaluations for the week are like Power to the giraffe! <laughs> like, ridiculous. <laughs> no wonder it took me so long to get a job. <laughs> like, power to the giraffe? What does she do in these classrooms? Um, and But it's actually come in handy in the years since then, because there really is part of me that is like, I think that a story should be like a giraffe or like a made up creature. Like, all of its parts have to have a reason for being there. And, and, and they all have to work in concert. You know, they, they all like have to be part of this autonomous whole, but like what that shape is can be anything. And I think like that's something that I let myself do with stories is that idea that like there is no shape. You know, I, I don't know, I, I teach all the time from Jerome Stern's Making Shapely Fiction and I love his little shapes of stories and his book, it's, you know, a good little craft book. But I also feel like those aren't the only shapes of story. Like the story can take any shape you want as long as it, is a fully functional being unto itself, whatever that shape is. So Mark, I don't know if that really answers why you never know what's gonna happen in my stories, maybe because you never know what kind of an animal I'm building because I don't know what kind of an animal I'm building until I built it and see if it works or not. And I don't, you know, I used to say with endings, I had a, a friend in grad school who I used to count on for my endings because I, as any of you who has spoken with me in the past two days now knows, I tend to sort of go on and not be able to end what I'm saying. And I'll like, you know, I then offer another like, oh, you didn't understand it that way. Let me offer another metaphor just in case. And that's just what I do in my stories too. I'm like, let me offer you 14 adjectives because maybe one of them will resonate. And, I had this friend in grad school, it was great. And she'd like literally draw a line in my stories and be like, end there. And I was like, okay, good. thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, cut out all the rest of that. Um, and, you know, maybe I learned from her. Maybe I learned sort of where to say like, this be you're just blithering into oblivion now, <laughs> like end there <laughs> and, you know, and cut it off. And maybe I just trained myself to do it over time. Um, it's funny because I my comment um, uh, goes from there. It has to do with endings, and and what I noticed about your story, besides uh, besides your wonderful reading of it and the character and um, and the, the pacing, like the dramatic tension is was just so incredible. But there, were, I felt like there were lots of places that maybe a different or lesser writer might have ended that story, but you drew it out and out and out. There were all these moments. And I, at least, you know, I recognized immediately, like my spider sense was going off right from the beginning. I, none of us trusted that character, right? So it wasn't like that was the mystery. We knew that he was going to scam her in some way, but the scam just kept going and going and going. And that's what I found it uh, to be, you know, so masterful. That's, so, yeah, thank, you. thank you. I appreciate that so much. There's part of me that I start reading that, like I, I start reading and I'm like, this is ridiculous. He's a total ass from like the get go. Like no one's gonna like. I can barely keep myself from laughing at the things that are coming out of his mouth. And like I sort of have to remind. I'm like, this is what a cheap idea. Like, what do you think people are gonna believe that this guy is really gonna repair her electricity or whatever? And then it's like I have to remind myself along the way. Like, well, that's not what it's about. It's not like it. It, it is clear that he's a jerk from from moment one and that it's got to be about something else and maybe so that that pleases me very very much um and i don't know i'm <laughs> i guess when people ask me about plot i usually take the really easy and pithy way out and quote um laurie moore's 
um, story, How to Become a Writer, where when when the writer in there is told that she has a ludicrous notion of plot, she answers, plots are for dead people. And I, you know, that's sort of always my like, my like, I don't know what to do with a plot. So I'll just offer this really quippy little thing. To, but but in a sense, like, I, I don't, I mean, I really do feel like I have a ludicrous notion of plot because I'm not all that interested in like what happened, but how it happened or like, how this thing got out of control in the way that it got there or something. So I, yeah, I'm just blithering now. <laughs> we have like maybe one more time for one more question. I mean, for the students, anybody? Here. Any faculty, anybody? Okay. Well, that was, oh, 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 there she goes, Sarah. Right, there we go. <laughs> Which is kind of building off what we've been talking about in terms of shape and just the confidence of spreading out and taking up that much room in a story, which I think is a little bit um, like rebellious in terms of literary trends right now. And I wonder if you think about that when you're writing in terms of like, where am I gonna place a story this long? Or, you know, are, are my readers gonna be able to handle this story if, you know, what they've been reading for the last five years is Flash. And I, and I remember yesterday at your craft talk, you also talked a lot about working with Flash and teaching Flash. And so I just wonder if, you know, length and compression and expansion is something that you're thinking about when you put together a collection or when you're revising stories, do you play with length? Is that on the top of your mind or is that happening intuitively? Yeah, I mean, I do, I, I, I don't think about it in terms of audience. Like I really try to like, like like those three people who are waiting for a new Thisbenison story, like, you know, <laughs> like I'm not so worried about them. Um, but I think like that idea of, um, like for me, different ideas sort of take up different amounts of space. And so there are places where like, you know, and any of my students can tell you like where I just want to go in and hack out any extra words that are in there. I want it to be as clear and concise and, you know, and um, tight as it can be. And then I think there are places where I'm going to leave myself a little more room and say like, you know, I'm going to let the story do some, you know, some spreading out, <laughs> some sit with its legs wide and, you know, see what, and, um, you know, I think there are different impulses. I'm not really thinking about sort of where to place it. Like, I think if anything, I'm thinking like, oh, there's a shape for this. Like if it gets longer than that, like it's a novella or something. And then if I realized that actually that novella was just really windbaggy and actually needs to get cut back down, then I'm sort of like, okay, well try to, you know, hack it down to something more potentially publishable or, or something. I don't know. There's so few publishing markets. Like if, <laughs> I can't even be bothered anymore to think about what people are going to actually publish. It's like, it's like trying to just make it be the size, you know, that it wants to be. Um, and I, that's pretty wishy-washy, I know, because how do you know how big something wants to be? But it's like how many pieces you have here I'm gonna go back to quilting because that's you know like like how much fabric have I collected like how much do I really need to go into this quilt and if I've got just like reams of this stuff like does it all belong in one quilt like is that going to even be useful if it gets that big maybe it's two quilts or you know like that that you do start to make kind of practical decisions on some level like if I have all this material, like, is it a novel or am I padding it and I really need to thin some of it out and it's something shorter than that. Flash, I think, like, it's, it's almost just like different ideas come with different 
um, the flashes like a like one idea, maybe with a few tentacles on it, and and short stories are a few more pieces, you know, linked together, and novels are like big unruly beasts with lots of claws and heads and whatever else, you know, and it's it's you know a matter of like hanging out with the material and seeing what it becomes but I'm I'm a pretty I don't know I feel a little bit proud that that like like it seems like rangy or something because I am like I'm a pretty vicious I, I call it being a lisher which comes from the from what we know that that the relationship between the editor Gordon Lish and the writer Raymond Carver, how Carver was known for being this minimalist and then after his death and that it came out that Lit, that Carver was actually writing a lot more and Lish was going through and like hacking it all out and making him a minimalist. So I, um, I, I had a boyfriend Longo who was a writer and we used to give each other work and say like, could you give this a really good lishing? You know, like I really need you to lish the shit out of this story for me, please. You know, and and uh, so I anyway. So I'm a lisher. You know, like I am, like I really do. I mean, I my last novel the first draft of it people are so sick of hearing me say this but the first draft came in at 823 pages and it was published at 356 and I cut it and I really did not cut content like I was not in there cutting out scenes or characters I was tightening language <laughs> 500 pages worth of it, you know, and it's doable. I mean, like, like it's doable. Um, so I don't even know where all of that goes to say, but like, I'm, you know, there are places where I feel like, all right, I'm going to let myself have all the adverbs I want here, you know, <laughs> like I'm going to spread out on this subway bench and, you know, let it go. And then there are places where I'm like, every single word better be doing you know 14 jobs at once or I don't get it you know it's out and um and maybe it's just what the material seems to call for in the moment I think that is a great place to stop it's doable <laughs> I don't think we'll ever think of giraffes the same way again um I want to thank you all let's done. This be a, a round of applause up here um, thanks, Sisby. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for bringing yeah, this amazing thank writer to us. Thank you all for coming. And, and Sisby, thank you for engaging us for the last two days. Um, it's so lovely to have you part of our Chatham family. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Good luck to all of you. Great. Have a good night, everybody.